Ori's development take. So, okay, so today we're doing invasive humans. So why is this within scope for a macroevolution class? Well, because we have here example of you know, dispersal of an animal across you know, the planet. I'm looking at the evolutionary effects of that, including extinction, possibly biased extinction. Okay? Um, <coughs> and it's a case that's you know, compelling to us because we're also humans. Right? Um, <coughs> right. So here we see uh, North American mammals and their body mass. Body mass. And we see <coughs> one that's in the next week, uh, survive of the gray ones. So, what do you see about this plot? Mm -hmm. Right, so it seems like it's a biased extinction. So, what are principal hypotheses for why this happens? Yes, yeah, so there's optimal foraging theory. You know, while well, everyone's chasing chipmunks, you can go and get a moose. Okay, what else? Mm hmm. This is why it's a bit harder to get. It's prey. It could be self-defense. Right? You could be wiping out large animals because they're, you know, want to be killed or have a chunk get killed by large animals. Okay, what else? Mm -hmm. The whole R versus K thing, right? R drones seem to be K species. Right? So, again, here we see how evolution and ecology connect. What else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, na the naive victim hypothesis, right? So we see humans go to certain you know islands, which we saw about with the Moas in the intro video, right? They're not evolved to deal to see humans as a threat. And they don't have good anti-human defenses. That's not a possibility. What else? Yeah, could be habitat. So, you know, humans, one thing we like to do is burn areas to have, you know, more fresh grass and things like that, or it would be easier to travel. And so we could have burned areas and caused issues that way. Yeah. Okay. So it's press limitation range size. Okay. What else? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so you make a buffalo blanket, you can't make a squirrel blanket very easily. There's a whole class of explanations people are missing. Say it again? 
Yeah, big ones can have a smaller population size, um, so it's you know, easier to drive them to extinction. Good. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They could be eating their food. So right now we're eating, you know, anchovies and things like that, and so larger predators have trouble getting food. Do we even know it's us? The correlation could have, could have been something else, right? So what else could cause? So I mean, what else could have caused a mass extinction of large mammals that didn't cause a mass extinction for us? It couldn't. It wasn't our fault. Climate change. How so? So yeah, it could be climate change. It's just a coincidence. Maybe the same climate change that let us cross over the Bering Land Bridge also played havoc with environments here. Good. What else? So it could be invasions of things we bring with us. Um, so in the same way, you know, humans release rabbits in Australia or mongoose in Hawaii and things like that. Or it could just be things that cross the language at the same time as us. Right? That also wreak havoc that weren't us. It's coincidental. Or eat diseases too. So I think of white nose syndrome now. What else? I can't think of anything else either, but let's see if you guys had the idea. Um, <coughs> so, one thing as biologists you want to do is figure out the explanations. We have a whole bunch of hypotheses now. Um, one thing people traditionally do is say, I think it's hypothesis X, and I'll fight to that if anyone says hypothesis not X. Okay. There's another approach where you can say, yes, there's a whole mixture of things, I don't know what it is. What would you do for an approach? What do you think is the most effective way to do the science? Okay. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, so like, the, so I mean, so same, same basic approach, right? Just disprove. You do it one all at once or one at a time. Um, what does it mean to disprove a hypothesis? So to disprove um, humans are choosing big, tasty things rather than small, tasty things. What does it mean for that to be disproven? Yep, yeah, so there's no significance. It could be, could be then it just proves it. Um, <coughs> one thing to be careful about with that is um, significance often comes from, uh, you usually when you project a null hypothesis, it means you often have a lot of power. All right, so in addition to significance, you should also look at the effect size. So, you know, if I can, so one thing I could show is you, maybe you can show, yes, they have a selection for higher, bigger body size, then maybe it's only, a 1% greater chance for bigger things to be hit than smaller things. And they okay, might be significant if they have a huge amount of data, it might not be biologically relevant. Whereas it might have a case where you know, there's a 200% higher risk for bigger things, and I don't have enough data to, to, to give me a low enough p-value. So I say, 
it's suggestive, but you can't prove it yet. So you can go out and do more to get more data. Good. That makes sense? What was the thing about VEX size? Okay. <coughs> Any thoughts about testing this? And these are sort of tensions in modern biology, too. So um, when you're th reading li biological literature and looking at what people are publishing, you know, some people just reject nulls. So do humans have no effect on mammals? No, they have, humans had some effect on mammals. Yay. Significant. Um, but more people are now looking at trying to figure out the relative weight of different factors and figuring out the biological meaning of these, of these parameters and models. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep, that'd be a great way to test it. So, if the thing is, you know, continental wide climate change and humans are sweeping through, we can see if there's an extinction in front of humans or if it only happens once humans arrive. Yeah, maybe those areas are weird in some other way. Maybe they're high elevation or desert or something. I need to control for those factors. Yeah. Good. Hey, yeah, you, you folks are thinking well about this. It's great. Yep, so we'll see later is a science paper that looks at, um, at when extinctions happen, when humans are there, when climate change happens. And so, yep, look, humans are here and it's going extinct, it must be humans. And it's a very correlational thing. We have a bunch of bodies in my basement, you might think, eh, yeah, maybe we should stay away from that guy's basement. So. Okay. <coughs> Here's a similar plot across from continents. Okay. Um, and of course, it's going to get harder to understand. It's flipped. Here, right. Okay, and it's the same sort of thing. Okay, where bigger things go ex uh, go extinct more. Okay, with a weird exception. What's the exception? In terms of extinction. In terms of percentage of extinction. Nice all of things we have to. Stuff. <laughs> 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 my hypothesis is there is that since we evolved in Africa, you know, animals there learn that, you know, the bipedal things that are throwing things are dangerous. Right? So stay away. And we've evolved some anti predator defenses against us. <coughs> yeah? Um, for Australia, mm -hmm. the first bar is that suggested for our Yeah, I'm not sure. That could be that there's nothing there, so they have no data. Or it could be, I mean, if there are things there that haven't gone extinct, I think it's the former. I'm not sure. Yeah. <coughs> look at fossil records of things that used to be there and things that aren't there now. And then what proportion of them are all over there. And of course for fossils you can you can reconstruct estimated body mass. <coughs> okay, here definitely correlational analysis. Right? Um, so number of megafaunal species and then our population size. Okay. 
So suggestive, but again, this is just a correlation. Right. There's actually another interesting thing. <coughs> Looking at um, our body mass versus metaclonal body mass, right, right now, there are more humans because of weight than there are other metaclonal. Okay, so, <coughs> these nowadays, all the resources that are going into food, <coughs> Okay, but that doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean that the extinctions are caused by us. Okay. <coughs> so here are a large set of hypotheses to explain this mass extinction. Okay, so um, you know, catastrophes, so maybe drought, you know, rock from outer space, habitat loss. Um, <coughs> you know, lots of, nut of nutrients, um, you know, invasion of new floral groups, and so you have this equilibrium. Um, so if you're someone that likes to, likes to browse on, on the bushes and you have a whole bunch of grass around, you have trouble eating the grass. Um, the intrinsic instability of the mass extinction. Um, <coughs> human impacts other than hunting. So reputation loss, introduced predators, so these many islands, frogs, rats, pigs, cats, so like that. Um, hyper disease, like so white nose, rabies, diseases like that. Yeah. <coughs> and then over the hypotheses, so one way to sort of sweep through killing everything quickly, and we sweep through and kill it more slowly. So here we're just feeding things off the cliffs. Here we're eating eggs in a few stages, one at a time. Okay. <coughs> and then there's other ideas too. So, he's a herbivore, so if we, you know, for example, we know in Africa, if you take out elephants, a lot of areas that's now savanna becomes forest. The elephants play a major role in uprooting trees. Right, so, save a tree, kill an elephant. Um, and so they assess some of things happened worldwide. Okay. <coughs> Ray switching. All right, so if you evolve to eat something and humans eat all of your fruit prey them, you might start eating other things and it drive them to extinction and then you. Um, and predator avoidance. <coughs> this idea of the ecology of fear. Who's, who, who's heard of that? Okay, what does that mean? Yeah. All right, so there's a physio physiological effects of fear. Good. Um, what else? No, you're... you're yeah. Yeah. All right. What does that mean? Right, and so what are examples of such things? Yep. Yep. So you see that happening, for example, in Yellowstone. Right, there used to be very few, I think it was, was it Aspen or Willows that weren't growing much? Remember? Aspen. Um, because elk were eating all the all the young aspen trees. Right? Once you get introduced wolves in the system, those areas aren't as safe for the elk, so they spend less time there. And so then the young trees can grow a little taller. Right? Not due to the numerical effect of having fewer elk, but just the elk have to hang out where it's safer. Okay. And that could happen here, where if humans come in, then herbivores stay in areas that are safer from, from predation, perhaps you know, have fewer food resources. Um, and again, we have this tension between, do we, is it just one hypothesis, or is it multiple ones? Right? You, don't, you don't want to say it's everything, right? it seems unlikely there's a single idea. And so this tension to figure out exactly which ones are playing a role. Okay, so here we see, <coughs> you know, could it be climate change is causing it? Here we have four consonants. We have weather conditions happen, okay. and then we have measures of 
um, food surface temperature. Okay. What's the point of this plot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's showing, showing what, where, when the when the extinctions happen. Yeah. Plots. Okay. And why are they plotting? Yeah. Oh. Why are they plotting on on something about sea temperature? <laughs> or these you know thinking about extinction of land mammals, right? So yeah, maybe maybe sea temperature affects sea lions or something. What's the point of here? So this is the proxy for temperature for climate change. Right? So if we see it moving a lot, it's changing a lot. And right? same way, the thermometer in your backyard tells something about global climate change. And then it's just a single point. Right? Here we have a record we can look at um, <coughs> for how quickly temperature is changing. Right? And now it's not in that before. And you can see it is correlated with extinction. Does it? Very visual way of doing it. But. Uh, so here's the present. Yeah, it's in thousands of years before present. Yeah. So I mean, some cases. So here, perhaps, we see if things are happening in this big bang through the shift. In most cases, you know, here, it's not a big shift. Right? It's a much bigger shift than the core of the Here, too. And so, <coughs> again, it's correlational, right? but it's suggestive that things could survive this magnitude of shift. Maybe this magnitude is enough to cause them to go extinct from some other cause. So again, suggesting we can rule out climate change. Okay. Um, so here we I've showed this plot before, and now let's unpack a little bit more. Right. So here we have in red when we arrive in different places. Okay. And then lose climate change. And then the numbers above are the number generally extinct. Um, anyone see a problem with using genera? The whole lumping and splitting thing. Right? So, um, you know, what you call a genus might be one species. Homo is this wonderful genus that has one species in it. Right? But someone else, you know, um, Astragalus is a genus that has, I think, 400 species in it. It's flowers. Um, <coughs> and so it's a less precise proxy than the number of species. Right? But, not, but also it's easier to detect in the fossil record. Right, so we think about looking at you know juice species of species in the fossil record. You know, how can you tell them apart that well? No. But it can tell bigger chunks apart perhaps. Okay. So we see with correlations. Again, it's very coarse, but Often. Right, so the Australia's food case, right? So it's going to here, not here. It's going to change up from here, we have it here. Here is what's clear. Right? Some change machines go occur, get a hard. <coughs> here again, some co-occurs, it's hard to tell. Yes, humans. Okay. 
um, here, about the climate change, you can click about some of the things that would change Okay. Um, here, how much attention at all, and what outcomes happen to the climate change. Okay, so it's definitely a mixed story. Okay, here's other evidence we can use to look at hu human hunting. Right, so yeah, this is a huge spear point. Right? It's not for hunting, you know, squirrels. Right? <coughs> and so we have evidence from you know where these people, those people, occur and when species when extinctions happen. Okay, so if you move into an area, you see these big mods that are kind of going away. We have very strong circumstantial evidence. Um, <coughs> and also the rapid clustering of extinctions in a short time period, hundred years. Right? I mean, nowadays we think that's a huge time period. If I said, you know, global warming is going to cause extinction in the next fifteen hundred years, but okay, fine, let my great 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 kids deal with it. Right? We're, we're worried about like the next forty years we're going to lose New York. Right? That's super fast. <coughs> um, but over a long evolutionary time scale, fifteen hundred is really really fast. Okay, when you think about you know, you know, huge periods of time with the rise of mammals, and extinction of dinosaurs, uneven dinosaurs, things like that. This is an instant in terms of geological time. Okay. <coughs> so here is a summary of these. So this is a review paper. I think that gives about humans being invasive and causing these extinctions. Okay. So observation. You know, most large mammals became extinct everywhere by Africa. Um, this was an unusual extinction, okay? and then it was biased towards large, slow, tasty animals. Okay? Um, and they say, you know, human this correlation um, with both when humans got there and um, white house selection suggests that humans played a role. Okay? But there may also been climate change, okay, too. So it's not a single cause, it could be multiple causes. Um, very unlikely to get bad climate and bad humans at the same time. Okay. Um, and people are upset by this. <laughs> okay. Um, so here we have another example um, looking at MOAs, right New Zealand, some of their predators, mass extinction event. It provides a different different way to look at mass extinctions. Okay. <coughs> so what they did instead was use a Leslie matrix and look at extinction risks. So what's a Leslie matrix? Anyone? Ecologists? <coughs> it's a discrete time way to look at um, how pre probably going from one life stage to another life stage, okay? Um, so it's like a it's like a basically a transition model, like in looking at DNA evolution. But so if going from A to T, you go from juvenile to adult, adult to egg, egg to omelet. So <coughs> you know there's ways you can go from like you know you can age, but also you can die. And so you can take this matrix and you can run, you can iterate over it, and you can see, okay, if I tweak you know, the birth rate, what happens? The population gets bigger. If I, you know, have it a little bit smaller, what happens? The population is stable. Okay, so they took this sort of method in ecology <coughs> and got parameter estimates. Stick in this matrix. Okay, so if you're doing this model, you want to show, you know, whether or not humans had a role in the extinction of MOAs, how would you pick parameter estimates? What sort of, so you have this uncertainty, right? So humans ate between one and one, one MOA every year or one MOA every week? Which, which value would you use? Yeah, so assume you have data like that, but you have, then you have an estimate where people say, you know, it's one one per month to four per month. And the literature disagrees and there's no information about which, where it isn't within this range. What would you do? Okay. Okay. 
perfect. Right? So we want to get this more precise. Okay? Assume this is as precise as you can get it. So you've exhausted all of the data in the planet. You know, it's one or four per, per, per month. Okay, so why is that conservative? Right, so if you say, okay, I'm trying to show that humans were a cause of extinction. If I take the all the data that argues against it most against that hypothesis most strongly, so yeah, if, if you know a human needs a mole every day, we need to extinction. Let me take the most conservative one and say, let's get the lowest ball estimate for this, and then see if even with those estimates we still get extinction. Then it's just very strongly that you have extinction from humans, right? Um, and that's what they did. So. So, okay, we looked at what the population of the was. It was around 158,000, when the biggest previous estimate was around 8,000, right? 80,000. Okay, so let's say, let's give them more MOAs. Um, we have a small population of human humans. Let's have a slow population growth of humans. So, everything they did was submit to be conservative against their hypothesis. Okay, and then they found out, you know, woohoo! You know, we, you know, the and so they show that <coughs> even with their very conservative ideas and parameter values, they still led to more extinction. Okay. So if you were a scientist and you were doing this, and you found that you know with these very conservative values you didn't get extinction, what would you do? So you play with your numbers to get the right answer? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to challenge you. I mean, you're right. So that's, I mean, people would look at sensitivity in that way and see, you know, sure, maybe four, but if it, well, maybe one doesn't work, but if it's 1.1, then you can say, okay, yeah, at the extremes, it doesn't work, but for a reasonable range of values, from 1.1 up to four, it does cause extinction. But it's something to think about as a you know, scientist. If you do this conservative approach and it doesn't work in terms of giving you the result you think is true, you know, is it fair to go and try a range? I mean, it's certainly not fair to go and try a range and only report the ones that are significant. I and mean, that's wrong. Right? But can you show the full range and say, yes, over this range, it's significant? <coughs> Discussion about that or questions about that? Right, so it could be, you know, if you have, you know, humans in the equation you go extinct, if you have change anything else in the equation, it also goes extinct. And then you want to try you know, other parameters in there too, because the other factors could be leading to it. Good. Okay. So two points from this are one another approach using this ecological you know population growth to look at possible extinction risk. Okay. The other thing I want to tell, teach you about with this section is looking at um, ways to do science conservatively, and then how do you deal with that? Okay. <coughs> Other questions about this? You have the linear model, but it has um, one factor is just humans eating eggs, and the factor they added was humans eating eggs and humans destroying habitat. And seeing those, I mean, those together cause extinction faster. I don't, uh, I don't think they did in this model, because they, they know that humans did eat the eggs. Yeah. 
But you're right, you could do that too and then show. It could have just been habitat loss as well. Yep. Okay. We believe it's estimated that, but then there's a parameter. Yeah. Any other questions? So here are all cool things that you should not go to Australia to look at anymore. Because they're all gone. Um, <coughs> so, you know, giant kangaroos and, and giant fucking birds and bad things. You know, no longer there. Okay. <coughs> so again, the question here is how do these go extinct? Um, and so, here again, the things, the things where the present is in these plots, right? Here, we are here, right? It's going back in time. And so, here we have a depiction of these, you know, large, large white birds, okay? Here we have when we arrived in Australia. Okay. Um, <coughs> and here we have temperature on the present time and no dust. Positive. Okay. So again, what we're doing is looking to see if this extinction pulse correlates with something weird happening with climate. And apparently not. Right. Let's go look at the constant. You know, Temperature is in the range of other than just then. Right, so, you know, it's basically holding those factors constant, and the only thing that changes is humans being present. <coughs> Alright, here we're looking at um, the ratio of C3 and C4 plants in the diet. And again, here's present, going back in time. What do you see? We don't feel, ask questions if you don't get this. That's fine. C3 versus C4. People don't know what that is. Is that from the class? Okay. Yes or no? No. Okay. Can we explain C3 versus C4? C4. I don't know if pineapple is C4. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Right, so this is a portion of, so carbon has different isotopes, right? And basically the more processing it goes through, you get enriched for certain isotopes. And so you can see, so um, C4 plants have a way of storing carbon and it goes to pro pro the processing, so it has um, le less carbon-13 in it, okay? And so you can get a proportion of how much of C3 versus C4 is being eaten based on how much of the relative portion of C13. Okay. Mm -hmm. Use with modern stuff too, so you can say, okay, 
Are squirrels eating mostly grasses or are they eating mostly acorns? So you can look at that by looking at the, these proportions. And you can look at other things, you can look at nitrogen as well. So here, it's the three points from this range, the four points in this range, and then you know, we arrive, all of a sudden you just start eating different things. Okay. <coughs> so remember, climate isn't changing at this point, right? So climate's not changing, but the plants around are changing. Okay. So the hypothesis they're advancing is that um, what happens is humans start burning the landscape, okay, which certainly kills C4 plants, and so you're left with mostly C3 plants. And so those that eat mostly C4 plants in the mixture die out. Those that survive, switch what they eat. Okay, so again, it's a this is a case then of habitat change caused by, caused by humans. Um, rather than hunting by humans, these two extinctions. Uh, I'm not sure. If, if, uh, in C4, but I would grass it. So that would be consistent. But I'm not sure that's the exact case here. Yeah. A lot of Australian plants are adapted to deal with fire. Like, a lot of trees are adapted to deal with fire. But if you have human set fires going through, it means that grasses get burned out, but eucalyptus can survive. So, do, do they have like a core that you don't to support this fire that you need fire and you have to destroy the tree? I know, so that's the question. So, what you could do is do a core um, in an old lake or something like that and look for you know, how frequently you get ash layers through time, and also which pollen grains are present through time, and see if you, you, know, you start loot having you know, much, much more ash and also only fire adapted plants. I'm not sure if they've done that yet for us, but I would be surprised if they have. Yep. Yeah. It's always good to think about other ways to test these things. And so, one of the ways what these are eating, one of the ways what's else is present. Good. Okay, so again, taking a step back, here's an example of where we have a large, a large um, extinction pulse caused not by predation, but by habitat modification okay, through human actions. Okay. And again, I don't want to do, I'm not doing this to make you feel guilty about being humans, right? um, <coughs> but just to show the effect of a single species you know, on extinction dynamics. Okay. So questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, uh, they because they wouldn't say Yeah. So the suggestion is they could do the switch. But yeah, it's not a Other questions? All right. Good. I'll send you a link soon. I'll have a poll where if you have any more suggestions for additional topics you want me to cover, let me know. And then I'll make a poll and let you all vote on the poll.